Welcome to Money Thinkers, the channel where we dive deep into the intriguing world of money and the movers and shakers behind it. Today, we're diving headfirst into the captivating and controversial realm of Monsanto, a company that has been under intense scrutiny and labeled by some as the epitome of evil. Buckle up, because we're about to unravel the truth behind the staggering $10 billion fine and the claims that paint Monsanto as the most evil company in the world. But before we proceed, let me make you a promise. A promise of unbiased exploration and a deep dive into the verifiable facts surrounding Monsanto's controversies. You see, it's easy to get caught up in sensationalized narratives and one-sided perspectives. That's why we're here, to cut through the noise and present you with a fair and balanced analysis of this complex issue. We'll shine a light on the recent developments that shook the legal landscape, like the shocking extortion charges faced by Virginia lawyers and the Supreme Court decision upholding a multi-million dollar award to a Roundup user. And let's not forget Bayer's jaw-dropping settlement of over $10 billion while continuing to sell the product without explicit safety warnings. It's a tale filled with twists and turns that will leave you questioning the nature of corporate responsibility. So, help us beat the algorithm by hitting that like button and keeping the comments section abuzz with your thoughts. To really understand Monsanto's controversies, we have to go back to the beginning. Monsanto first started as a chemical company all the way back in 1901. For most of the 20th century, Monsanto mainly produced agricultural chemicals like pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers. But things began to change in the 1980s when Monsanto shifted its focus towards biotechnology and became an early pioneer in genetic modification. The company created the first genetically modified plant cell in 1982 and the first genetically modified crop, a soybean with resistance to a herbicide called glyphosate in 1996. Glyphosate, sold under the Roundup brand, soon became Monsanto's star product and a huge moneymaker for the company. Since the genetically modified crops they created could withstand being sprayed with Roundup, farmers were able to spray whole fields to kill weeds while leaving crops untouched. This convenience made Roundup extremely popular with farmers. Through a series of acquisitions and mergers over the years, Monsanto expanded into areas like seeds, traits, and agricultural biotechnology. The company came to dominate several key markets like genetically engineered cotton seeds, yielding enormous power and influence over the agricultural industry. Today, Monsanto primarily focuses on three major lines of business, seeds and traits, agricultural productivity, and biotechnology. The company develops genetically modified seed traits, sells genetically modified seeds for major crops like corn, cotton, and soybeans, and produces agricultural chemicals and crop protection products. In short, Monsanto has become an agricultural and biotechnology giant, shaping the global food system with a focus on genetically modified seeds and agricultural chemicals. Whether you see this as progress and innovation or unwanted consolidation of power in food production is a debate at the core of Monsanto's controversies. The key controversy around Monsanto revolves around the safety of glyphosate, the main ingredient in Roundup. But what does science actually say? The overall consensus among regulatory agencies is that glyphosate is not carcinogenic or cancer-causing at levels humans are exposed to. Groups like the EPA, WHO, European Food Safety Authority, and others have reviewed decades of research and determined glyphosate is, quote, unlikely to pose a carcinogenic risk to humans. However, some studies have found possible links to cancer. The 2015 International Agency for Research on Cancer Study classified glyphosate as, quote, probably carcinogenic. But this study has faced criticism for flaws in its methodology and selective use of data. Meanwhile, several large-scale studies provide stronger evidence against health risks. A 2017 study of more than 54,000 agricultural workers found no association between glyphosate exposure and cancer at four common tumor sites. A 2019 meta-analysis of six studies with over 300,000 participants found, quote, no evidence of an association between glyphosate-based herbicide use and overall cancer incidence. 
a 2020 review of over 1,700 studies concluded that, quote, available data do not support glyphosate as a human carcinogen at levels that humans are known to be exposed. So while some individual studies point to possible risks, the strongest and largest studies to date find no convincing links to cancer. Of course, the debate continues as new research emerges. But at the moment, the bulk of evidence, including decades of human exposure with no discernible cancer patterns, points to glyphosate not posing a meaningful cancer risk at typical exposure levels. The research on glyphosate safety continues to evolve. Do you believe the current evidence is convincing? Weigh in below. Comment convinced if you find the bulk of evidence, including the lack of discernible cancer patients, convincing that glyphosate poses low risks. Comment cautious if you feel there are still too many gaps, uncertainties, and potential biases to draw definitive conclusions. Neither option is right. Both viewpoints come from a place of reason. So share your perspective below. I'm keen to read thoughtful responses that identify both the strengths and limitations you see in the current data. Let's look at a typical example. In 2016, Edward Hardiman, a longtime Roundup user, filed a lawsuit claiming that decades of using the herbicide to treat poison oak and weeds on his California property led to his non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The case garnered widespread attention and made its way to the Supreme Court, where a decision was made that upheld the award of $25 million to Mr. Hardiman. It's crucial to acknowledge the significance of individual cases like Edwin Hardiman's and the legal process that accompanies them. In the context of legal proceedings, the focus shifts to evaluating the evidence, considering expert testimony, and assessing the scientific merit of the claims. The Supreme Court's decision to uphold the award highlights the weight given to the connection between Roundup and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in this specific case. Of course, individual circumstances and scientific evidence play a crucial role in shaping legal outcomes. However, it's essential to note that legal rulings are not the definitive verdict on the overall safety or evilness of a company. They provide a glimpse into specific instances and should be considered alongside a broader examination of scientific consensus and regulatory assessments. Monsanto's history is intertwined with controversies, legal battles, and groundbreaking scientific advancements. The company's pioneering work in agricultural biotechnology, including the development of genetically modified crops, sparked both admiration and criticism. While some hailed these innovations as revolutionary solutions to global food challenges, others expressed concerns about the long-term effects on the environment and human health. Amidst ongoing controversies, lawsuits, and public debates, Bayer emerged as a key player in the story. In 2018, Bayer completed its $63 billion acquisition of Monsanto, marking a significant milestone in the realm of corporate consolidation. This monumental move brought together two industry giants, creating a powerhouse that commanded attention worldwide. The acquisition sparked discussions about the motivations behind the deal. Critics pointed to the potential influence of corporate interests and the consolidation of power within the agricultural and chemical sectors. Meanwhile, proponents highlighted the potential for enhanced research capabilities and the synergy between the two companies' expertise. Moving on, Bayer, the new parent company of Monsanto, found itself at the center of a storm as the legal battles intensified. In an attempt to resolve the multitude of claims, Bayer made the bold choice to enter into settlements with the affected parties. The sheer scale of the settlements, surpassing the $10 billion mark, and easily among the largest settlements ever in U.S. civil litigation, highlights the magnitude of the issue and the potential impact it had on individuals' lives. However, an intriguing aspect arises when we consider Bayer's decision to continue selling Roundup without incorporating additional warning labels regarding its safety. This move raises important questions about the delicate balance between corporate responsibility and the financial implications faced by a multinational conglomerate. Is it possible for a company to acknowledge legal battles and settlements while simultaneously maintaining the sale of a product without explicitly warning consumers about potential risks? These questions present us with a fascinating ethical and legal dilemma, where the lines between corporate accountability, public safety, and financial considerations become blurred. While the current science points to glyphosate not posing a meaningful health risk, we must acknowledge important caveats and unknowns in the data. First, most studies on glyphosate have been conducted by Monsanto itself or other industry groups with a financial stake in the safety of Roundup. This creates potential for bias and conflicts of interest that limits our confidence in the findings. 
Regulatory bodies also largely rely on data submitted by Monsanto for their assessments. So, while regulatory bodies conclude glyphosate is unlikely to cause cancer, their conclusions are shaped in part by industry-funded studies and information. Second, much of the research examines the health risks of glyphosate alone. But humans are exposed to Roundup, which contains not just glyphosate, but also other chemicals that may act differently in the body. Studies on the whole formulation are more limited. Third, long-term health effects are inherently difficult to discover through traditional scientific studies. Many conditions like cancer can take decades to develop. More time and research is needed to gain a full picture of Roundup's impact on human health. Finally, the data on glyphosate is often conflicting or subject to interpretation depending on studies included, methods used, and funding sources of researchers. There are also gaps in our understanding of how chemicals might interact in complex biological systems. In summary, while many signs point to glyphosate not posing a meaningful risk, important litigations, gaps, and potential biases in the current research prevent definitive conclusions either way. We must be careful not to overstate the evidence in either direction. The safest approach is caution and prudence given legitimate unknowns, while continuing to seek clarity through unbiased, independent research. An admirable goal would be full transparency, combined with a dose of humility about what we can and cannot say with certainty based on the current data. You've likely come across the sensationalized stories, the exaggerated claims, and the unfounded accusations that have elevated Monsanto to the realm of infamy. But let's take a step back and examine the facts with a critical eye. It's important to acknowledge that, as a human organization, Monsanto, like any other company, is a mixture of good and bad. Yet, it seems that the stories about how evil Monsanto is have been elevated to gospel, often driven by extremists who see their cause as righteous. They attack anyone who doubts their claims, while those who approve of Monsanto are deemed good. But let's remember that truth is rarely so black and white. To form an accurate and balanced perspective, we must dig deeper and examine empirical, original source materials, not fall prey to propaganda or social memes that have taken on a life of their own. We must resist the temptation to buy into false dilemmas or succumb to the pressure of tearing down a perceived evil without substantial evidence. So let's leave Monsanto in the critical realm where skeptics leave things. Neutrality. This doesn't mean we label it as good, great, or amazing. It simply means we approach the topic with an open mind, ready to explore the substantiated facts and separate them from the unsubstantiated claims. It's a path paved with reason, evidence, and the pursuit of truth. Is Monsanto truly the most evil company in the world? Or is it a multifaceted entity that deserves a fair and objective assessment? For me, the answer lies in the power of critical thinking, the exploration of verifiable facts, and engaging in open-minded discussions. You're welcome to share your thoughts, experiences, and perspectives in the comments section below. Together, we can continue to explore complex topics and challenge our own assumptions. Thank you for joining us on this thought-provoking journey. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to our channel for more captivating content, and hit the notification bell to stay updated. Thanks for your time, and I'll see you in the next one.